we're walking through a sermon series through the book of John, the Gospel of John. Uh, gospel just means good news, and there's four of these in the New Testament uh, on the second half of the Bible, and they're about the life of Jesus. John has a special, special story about the life of Jesus because he's focusing on, in on making sure we are very clear in understanding Jesus is God. He's not just a good man. He's God. We're in John chapter 10. For those of you who want to follow along, we have Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you in English and Spanish. Uh, 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 we have you got your Bible app there. I'm going to have the scriptures uh, on the screen, but if you want to follow along there, go ahead and turn to John chapter 10. We're going to be in verses 10, uh, uh, 1 through 21 here this, this morning. As we unpack God's word today, you see very clear the theme that Jesus is the shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And he gives us life. But that life comes at a cost of his own life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer here. Holy Spirit, we need you to, 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 to open our hearts to hear your word, to receive your word. Lord Jesus, to know you and be changed by you. Lord, let, let us not just be distracted by this past week or whatever is going on in our head and our hearts, let us not just be caught up in just routine, like, hey, I'm put, punching the clock here. I showed up. <sighs> Jesus, I, I know you want to meet us. You want to show us yourself as the good shepherd. So I pray for that. I pray for a powerful meeting with you this morning. So open our hearts, open our minds to encounter you. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to jump right in here. John chapter 10. We're going to start with verses 1 through 5. We're going to take this a uh, 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 bit by bit here. So what, John 10, 1 through 5. Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. All right, let's get caught up here. Jesus is teaching here as he's talking about shepherding in, in, in ancient times uh, where he's at. This is still in the context of the healing he just did of a blind man. In the context of this massive feast uh, that they've been a part of, the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? Uh, uh, so trying to bring you all up to speed if you, if you, if you, you haven't been us within the previous weeks here. This is part of a bigger conversation, Okay. So in this, in this time where, where there's this blind man who's been healed and he's been kicked out of uh, the Jewish churches, if you will, merely just for being healed and acknowledging the truth that Jesus had to be from God. Jesus speaks these words. He starts talking about shepherding. Now, this is a, 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 an image and a metaphor. Shepherding uh, would, would be just totally common today like, like our farmers would be. If Jesus were referring to uh, some of our farmers pulling uh, combining grain and or, uh, corn and, and, and beans here. Shepherding in this time, some things for us to understand. Uh, the shepherding was uh, a livelihood for a lot of people. It was, it was very common such that it wasn't just on the outskirts of town, which our, our farmers today do, but, it was, uh, but they had their livestock even in town. And so they had these things called these, these courtyards, if you will, that were made of stone and such. And, and these courtyards were, were in town, and, and now a family did, had uh, maybe, maybe a handful or more of sheep uh, each, and so they would, they would kind of combine co-op, if you will. They were the first co-ops uh, together and have a sheep pen for multiple families where they would have uh, their sheep there. Now, as you can see here, there would be one opening, which would be the, where the gate was put uh, for for the sheep pen. This would be a place that would be guarded or, or handled by a, uh, a, a gatekeeper. And that gatekeeper only would allow in those people who are responsible for the sheep. 
Those sheep know the voice of their owners, their shepherds. So, so therefore, because the gatekeeper's there, somebody who's, who's wanting to come in to steal isn't going to go through the door. So as Jesus starts up, he sets up the scene here. He's contrasting the sh- shepherds versus the thief. And where do they come in? Uh, the, the shepherd goes right through the door. He's trusted by the sheep. He wants the sheep to draw near to him. The sheep, the sheep to hear the voice and know him intimately, personally. There's trust, there's security. They're in the presence of the shepherd. But to, but to the thief, they don't care. The thief doesn't care about the shepherd. They're just concerned about themselves. And so they hop the fence. And I think of, of, of growing up and our neighbors who told my brother and I, when we kicked the ball over playing soccer, go through the gate, please. Go through the gate. But on our selfishness and rebelliousness, my brother and I, we were lazy and we hopped the fence. We were just thinking about ourselves. That's what we do when we think about ourselves. We don't honor others. We, we don't go through the gate. So Jesus sets up here the, this, this scenario. But in verse 6, six we see it's, it's fallen on deaf ears. The, the, the audience didn't understand. So, so let's keep going here. Verses 6 through 10. So this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand it, what they were saying to them. He didn't get the point. They didn't get the point. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came, they may have life and have it abundantly. So as Jesus takes the metaphor here of shepherding, the shepherd, the sheepfold, that fencing system and the gate, he takes it now and he begins to expand it and unpack it to make it very clear. And he does so with two purposes. He shows that he is two things in the metaphor. He's the gate, but he's going to also explain he's the shepherd as well. In explaining here that he's the gate, he talks about he's the only way, the right way, in and out of the sheepfold for the sheep. He's the only way for the sheep to get access to the pasture where they can be fed, where there's abundance, where there's that lush green grass to chew on, to eat, to be fed. But there's these robbers, these thieves. They don't come in by the gate. They come in by their own way. They have their own agendas. They have their own desires and their own needs to be met. Jesus is referring to teachers who've gone before him, who are false teachers, who set themselves up as we have the truth. We're from God, but they're not. There's clear lies. You see, he explains that he's the gate. It's only through him that there is life. You see, their their teaching would would not lead people to or through Jesus. Their teaching would lead them to themselves. Their teaching would ultimately lead to destruction. He's talking about uh, shepherds that that came before who claimed to be messiahs. But they they only led to political revolution. It led people ultimately to their death, an empty death, a hollow death for nothing. Jesus' words and, and his references through John He makes several I am statements. We've already talked about where he says, I'm the light. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. All of these I am statements are the fulfillment of things that God had, had, had foretold hundreds and thousands of years before through his prophets and teachers in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see these things recorded. And so we go back to the book of Ezekiel. We see Jesus even there. 600 years before Jesus even came a, became a human being and took on human flesh, we see these words spoken about him in reference to shepherds 
who are leading people astray in Israel. Check out these words here. Ezekiel 34, this is verses 1 through 4 here. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves in the wool. You slaughter the fatted ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought out. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. Let's skip down to verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the, his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. 600 years before Jesus is coming, and go to the next slide. 600 years was foretold. God was saying, I will come. I will be the shepherd of my sheep. And Jesus says, I am the shepherd. There's no, there's, there's, there, there is no coincidence here. Jesus is very clearly referring to himself as it was many times God referred to himself in the Old Testament as I am the shepherd. Jesus is very clearly declaring, I'm God. I am the fulfillment, the long-awaited shepherd, God coming to care for his people, for all people. But as he declared, the thieves who come to steal, kill, and destroy, they continue to come, even today. We still have these kinds of thieves and robbers who still come in with intention of leading people astray, of intention of, of leading people to themselves. And great movements have been formed even around certain individuals and cults and, and, and false, false teachers. These, these peoples have selfish agendas. And how do we discern between a false teacher? One, first and foremost, they deny Jesus is God. Any of these robbers or thieves that would steal people away from God and try to draw them to yourself, they deny that Jesus is God. We have, we, we have an entire religious sects that have been formed, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, others. There's oneness Pentecostals. All of these are even within our own community who claim to have the truth, but they are off in so many ways because they deny that Jesus is God. God. They deny the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and therefore deny our salvation through Him. Anytime that people draw attention away from Jesus as God, they are deceivers, thieves, and robbers. But Jesus says, those who come through me the door, I am the door. They will be led out to pasture. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Psalm 23, which we read earlier, speaks of God being the good shepherd. And in that, he talks about 
You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You see, it's in relationship with the good shepherd that there is abundance. Now, Jesus isn't talking about uh, there's going to be a a, a feasting and and, and there will be no poverty, that you're going to have everything you could ever desire here and now. That's not what he's talking about. First and foremost, when he says that I've come that you may have life and life to the fullest, that that he's talking about about future life, that he's securing an eternal life, that he's securing, where 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 he makes everything whole. In Revelation, we hear it it explained that there is no more tears, that there's no more crying, there's no suffering, there's no death. But but imagine, and I know many of you do imagine, we long for. Joy, unending. Peace that never ends. Wholeness. There's no more brokenness. There's no more pain. There's no traumas that are going to keep revisiting you. Just unending fullness. And and, and, and that we can't imagine. We, we, We just can't fathom. And it will never end. It will never get tiring. It will never, it will never grow dull. Just unending joy. We don't have the capacity to experience that even now. But that's, while, while, while that awaits us in the future, when all evil and, and injustice are gone and removed because Christ comes and everything will be made new, well, there is no death. That abundant life shines into our present moment. You see, as David explained, you prepare my table in the midst of my enemies. You see, because when, when we have the good shepherd as our shepherd, we are satisfied not in our circumstances, but in him. The shepherd satisfies us now. You see, because in, in the midst of conflicts, whether that's in your family or that's in our culture and society, we're talking about our brothers and sisters who are persecuted around the world. They live in danger every day at the risk of uh, of being killed or jailed for being a Christian. That's real. And yet they can have peace in the midst of conflict, pressing, imminent danger. We can have peace now. Do you know that that's true? And that can be true for you. You see that fullness of life, that abundance of life. If he is your shepherd... And if we are satisfied in him, we're not seeking for our circumstances to do something that they will never do. And we keep going back to those, you know what I'm saying? You keep going back for that internal feeling to stick and stay around. It ain't going to stay. Your, for, for your circumstances, for peace in life to just stay. I mean, now, don't our farmers know, like, you go out there and, and the combine breaks down and you just had it fixed, Right? Like, what in the world's going on? You, just, you have to come to expect problems are going to happen. Our circumstances are not where our hope is. He talks about, it goes on further beyond our circumstances. He says, you anoint my head with oil. He raises you up. You see, when this idea of him anointing us with oil is meaning he takes us as our pride possession. That he intimately knows you and cares for you. You are known. You are seen in in whatever your circumstances and situation. You are seen and you are loved. You and your uniqueness. And he's pursuing you. The shepherd loves you right where you're at. It doesn't matter what kind of situation you're in or brokenness or whatever you have done. He loves you and desires you. You are his if you will come through the gate. And finally, my cup overflows. There's no end to his goodness and his love toward you. There's no end. You can't cause it to end yourself even. So there's abundance of life. There's fullness that comes, but you got to go through the gate. He makes it very clear. You got to go through the gate. We want to come. We want to go, go through our own ways. We want to climb out. And fall. Oh, there's these easier paths that these liars, these robbers and thieves will promise us if you'll just come this way. 
if you'll follow this easier kind of teaching. God is love. He doesn't care what you do. He loves, he affirms you, whatever you do. No, that's a lie. It's not true. He loves you in spite of what you do. He's going to change you. There's sin. And as he go on, goes on here to explain as he's the shepherd, we'll break this down even further. So he is the gate. There's only hope for abundant life, for fullness of life, now and for eternity, only through Jesus. He is the gate. There's no shortcuts. You're part of the problem, the ultimate problem, is that we want to be God. And we want Jesus to serve us, but we don't want to follow Jesus' way. We don't want him to dictate to us. He's not a good man with good ideas. He's God. And so he keeps going. He says in verse 11 here, join with me. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and, and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? In these final words here, as Jesus completes the metaphor, I am the good shepherd. As we've talked about, he's referring to himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is God. And he explains here, the good shepherd is not like a hired hand. He lays down his life for his sheep. Many people have, have, have reduced this the idea of, of Jesus as the shepherd laying down his life for his sheep as some kind of example. Now, as a shepherd at that time, they needed to be prepared for a variety of different attacks. There, there, were, there were wolves, there were mountain lions, there were bears that, would, that could attack, that did attack, but it wasn't frequent. It wasn't kind of an everyday occurrence. Now, the, these shepherds, they, they, would, they would defend the sheep, but they weren't going to necessarily sacrifice themselves for one sheep because they had a whole flock. But they would go and they would, they would, they would try to beat off or, or scare away. They would go towards the danger. Whereas the, the hired hand, on the other hand, the hired hand, they had, they had no cost in the matter. The sheep was not theirs. They, 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 they didn't feel the financial burden of the loss of a sheep. And so they would run, right? They would flee. These hired hands are, 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 like, other, are like teachers today who, in the midst of, of the threat of culture, begin to compromise the truth of the gospel. The, the, but we'll water it down to make it easier because we're under pressure because it's not culturally popular. We have to be wary. You know, I believe that these, God intends, they're, they're hired hands, they have good intentions, but ultimately they get caught up in selfishness in another way of self-preservation. And so we'll water down the gospel. What I mean by, by the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that story is that we were made by God for God. But we, we broke relationship with God. We said we wanted to have nothing to do with that. Instead, we said we wanted to be God. 
Lord, I want to do what I want to do. I want to have the right to do what I want to do and determine right from wrong. We're all struggling in that problem. We all are infected by that sin. And there's a need of sacrifice. You see, there's, there's justice. If God is good, if God is loving, and he is love, he's the definition of love, but, but if he is love, he's got to be a just God. Love is holy. He's perfect. And therefore, there must be justice. And that justice is directed towards our sin. All of us deserve justice. We don't like to think about it like that, though. We like to think other people deserve justice. Other people are bad, but no, we're not that bad. The wages of sin, what we earn for our sin, our self-centeredness, our our desire to be God, is eternal death, is hell. There's a sacrifice. Death must come. Justice must be served. And so God sent Jesus, his own son, to serve that justice for us. God, God had a plan knowing we would leave him to satisfy his justice in himself. And that's what makes the good news good news. Jesus explains here the good shepherd in verse 11 lays down his life for his sheep. He goes on later explaining explaining more about this. In verse 17, I lay my life down to take it up again. Nobody takes it from me. You see, the shepherd... At that time, if some danger came on the shepherd, it was a bear or a mountain lion or, or something, that was not an unexpected event, all right? That was unplanned. But Jesus knew he came for a purpose. It wasn't, he wasn't going to be surprised, and, and, he, and, and he was just kind of getting himself ready for any kind of shock and awe there. He knew he had one purpose, I'm going to die. He intentionally set himself for the very purpose of taking hell in our place. It wasn't for a good, to be a good example, to be a martyr for a good cause. He was set to die in our place. There's a, 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 a story of two brothers on a farm. And uh, as the story goes, they were, they were out playing while well, there was uh, farm work going on, and, and they, they went to a silo, and, and they, were, they got in the silo on the, on the, on the corn and the grain, and, and, uh, and evidently there's this thing called grain entrapment. It's a phenomenon. And there can be pockets, air pockets, that can form underneath the grain, and they were playing in there, and... While they, one of these pockets opened up, and they, they, they were caught in this hole, this pocket that had opened up, and the grain was coming in. It's kind of like quicksand from what I understand. And it was filling in rapidly. Well, the family, over time, they didn't know what had happened. They started to search on the property. Uh, it, it, it's dinner time, and they're looking. Where are, the, where are the boys? Where are they at? And they're searching and searching and searching. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the guys goes to the silo, and he sees the head of one of the boys sticking up in the grain. And they go and, and rushing to that child, being careful because themselves could get caught up in the, the grain and entrapment scenario themselves and it's the younger brother and he has a pulse and he's still alive and they dig him out and they're asking him where as he comes to consciousness where is your brother and he explains i was standing on his shoulders and his younger brother his older brother had died sacrificing himself for the younger brother in order that he might live. This story, when I, when I was first heard it 20 plus years ago, just broke me as the example of God, Jesus' sacrifice for us. But as powerful as it is, it's not powerful enough. Because you see, Jesus, Jesus just didn't die to give us Give us life. Jesus took hell 
for you and me. What we struggle with in understanding how significant is the life that God gives is because we don't know what we deserve. We don't fully get it. Jesus was at a a, a Pharisee's house. He was invited over for supper. And he's there reclining at this Pharisee who was a bit arrogant and standing off. And this woman who was sinful comes in, unwelcome, uninvited, and she's weeping. And, And she takes with her hair and her tears, and she goes to Jesus, and she's wiping and washing them. It's hard to imagine. I'm bald. I know. But she's she's wiping and washing his feet with her hair. And this man, this Pharisee, says to her, if he only knew what kind of woman this is, he wouldn't let her touch him. And Jesus turns to the man and he says, Simon, if somebody, you have somebody who who has a debt of of, of $10,000 and it's forgiven, but you have another person who has a debt of a million dollars, but that's forgiven, who do you think is going to respond stronger? Well, the one who's, who's, who's had the debt that's, It was a million dollars, obviously. And Jesus explained to him, she's been forgiven much, and so she loves much. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Friends, we we miss the gospel. We miss the significance of what the good shepherd does for us in laying down his life not just to give, his, give us life, but to take hell in our place. Friends, if we don't understand how much we're forgiven and how much he pays for us, then we're going to treat it trivially. But to those, when we get it, those who've been forgiven much, we love much. Our lives are radically changed. He wants to meet you in that place, a good shepherd. He wants to lead you out of your darkness and out of your sin and out of your brokenness, not just into the hope of of heaven, but into being changed now, being satisfied, being free from yourself and your sin. You see, friends, we, 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 we weigh gossip against murder. We, we, we weigh white lies against abuse. Sin is sin. When you break one part of God's commands, you break them all, is what he explains. You may not be a, a murderer, a rapist, some kind of violent criminal, but you have rebelled against God. I'm going to give an illustration here that may, has offended people in the past, but I want to understand the graphicness of this illustration because we don't think our sin is really that bad. But when we, in our sinfulness, in our condition, friends, we give God the finger. It's not a casual like, God, you, you're, you, I don't like you. Do you understand our sin is an, is, is an act of war? is an outright rebellion, offensive. But we, we, we want to make it, we want to, we want to sanitize it. You see, false teachers want to minimize sin. They want to minimize, therefore, the cost of the cross. They want to minimize, therefore, the love of Jesus by saying, Jesus loves you all and you don't have to be concerned about whatever's happened in your life or whatever, you, however you live. Do whatever you want. That minimizes the work of Jesus on the cross and paying hell in our place. Because it wasn't just for anything. It wasn't just to be a good example. It was to set you free. It was to take hell in your place. So I invite you this morning, friends. Come to the Good Shepherd. Who is your shepherd? You? Are you your shepherd? Or is Jesus your shepherd? Is somebody else? Are you following other other teachers? False teachings? Is Jesus your shepherd? 
Jesus gives us life, life to the fullest, by giving his own life. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on forward. As we close out here, I want us to, I want us to read together from Psalm 23. And I want you to consider the benefits of the shepherd are only for those who are his sheep. There's lots of sheep, but not everybody is his sheep. Have you come through the gate? Have you submitted to him and surrendered to him? Are you following the good shepherd and his voice? If so, these words are powerful and profound for you now. I'm going to have you stand. And let's read these together. May these be your prayer, our prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, for those of us who this is true, let this inflame our hearts with your love, Lord, knowing what you have given to us. As you told that woman, those who have been forgiven much, love much. May we not be so arrogant like that, that Pharisee, Lord God, that we think, Lord Jesus, that it is, our sin is just a little trivial thing, that we're really not that bad. But God, let us experience your, the wonder of your grace, knowing, God, that we are worse than we could ever imagine, but we are loved more, Father, than we can believe. Lord, penetrate us. I pray for those who are on the fence, if you will, Lord Jesus, that, that, that you might snatch them away from the robber and the thief, Lord Jesus. Lord God, you draw them to yourself to come through the gate today, to trust in you, Jesus, and know life to the fullest today. In your name we pray. Amen.